children's bedding, a small inkwell, an oil painting with a gold frame. Going once, going twice, going three times. From underwear to valuable art, everything was sold off. Nazis used auctions to generate millions that replenished their war chest. A hunt for bargains which left no stone unturned. I think it was an open secret that everything here which was Jewish property was sold at public auction. And people could figure out that their real owners hadn't gone on a holiday or to a health resort. The items belonged to Jews whom the Nazis had forced to flee the country. With their belongings packed in so-called lift vans, they hoped to build a new life in exile. But after the war began, very few of these crates went to their owners. Here in Hamburg's southwest harbour, thousands of crates were stranded from all over the German Reich. The Nazis confiscated them and auctioned off their contents. Goods that were meant for shipment went under the hammer in Bremen too. Most of the stolen objects are still missing. Catherine Kleibel is one of a few hundred provenance researchers in Germany. She's determined to resolve the case of Nazi looting once and for all. In true German fashion, their records back then were meticulous. About 3,000 households were auctioned off in Hamburg, and just under 1,000 more were auctioned off in Bremen. That makes a total of 4,000 complete households whose contents were auctioned off. It's easy to see that this amounts to millions of individual items. Katrin Kleibel searches for clues. She's on a mission for justice. The families already had a hard time leaving their homeland, and once they arrived overseas, for instance in America, they waited for their belongings to arrive and nothing came. The major goal is to eventually return these objects to their families. A difficult task, and one that the descendants of the families have long been hoping for, mostly in vain. The injustice suffered by the Koch family 80 years ago is still on their grandson's mind today. Where are these objects? Where did my grandparents' belongings end up? These questions don't give me a moment's peace. He hopes Kleibel's research provides answers. Hello. Hello. Good morning. It's nice to see you. It's nice to meet in such a symbolic place. Yeah. His grandparents' belongings, which included a valuable art collection, were also stored in a so-called lift van. How many lift vans and crates did your family have? I know of one big one and one smaller one. So there should have been two. The Nazis rose to power in 1933. Although Hitler's plans for extermination were made clear from the start, there was still a window of opportunity for the Jewish population to leave the country. Those who predicted what was coming and could afford to fled abroad. But in 1941, that window closed for good. Anyone who made it out of Germany believed they would be reunited with their belongings, provided they had paid for transport in advance. The costs were immense, but many of the crates never reached their owners. It was, of course, the goal of the National Socialists not only to push the Jewish minority out of the country, but also to completely disenfranchise and plunder them financially. And in that respect, there was little incentive to ship them their property in the first place. The Koch family came from Wiesbaden, 
Georg, a doctor, took an early interest in art, which he bought together with his wife. He died in 1933. His children fled to London, soon to be joined by their mother, Lotta. Her possessions, which included the family's art collection, were to follow by way of Hamburg's Southwest Harbour. That was the promise, but they never made it to London. In 1941, her boxes were confiscated. Photos, art, memories, documents, a life's worth of objects disappeared. In the end, everything was taken from them. And that is criminal, terrible, ghoulish. There are really no words bad enough to describe it. In the harbours, the Gestapo confiscated goods that were meant for shipping and auctioned them off. Even newspapers advertised opportunities to purchase cheap goods. A portable gramophone, an oil painting, circa 1750, 56 books. Here in the Hamburg State Archives, Katrin Kleibel meticulously searches through auction records. The Nazis were good at bookkeeping. Here we go. The individual contents of the Lefan were neatly listed here. And you always had the name of the object and the name of the person who bought it. Here, for example, it's the Museum of Ethnology and what was offered for the object or group of items in question, and it goes on here, page by page. From, say, art objects to books, everything was more or less sorted, like bed linen and bed frames, cookware, and so on. Her research is funded by the German Lost Art Foundation. What she seeks to establish is who was robbed, who was the buyer, and where are the items now? From the beginning of an object's journey, when it left its owner's house with the moving company, to the moment it was stored with the bailiff tasked with the job of auctioning it off. It basically lists who bought what and for how much, so that we get an overview. Were they private persons? Were they dealers? And what happened to the objects after that? Much like a detective, Katrin Kleibel gathers all the clues in a database. And from these puzzle pieces, I think we can trace the path of a lift van from its starting point, leaving the house, to its point of sale in Hamburg. Kleibel works as a provenance researcher here at the German Maritime Museum in Bremerhaven. Her job is to find out whether the items in the museum's collection were acquired legally. The Nazis also auctioned off personal effects from Jewish households here in Bremen. That's how Kleibel first became aware of this injustice. It struck me that this whole topic of Jewish migrants' property being auctioned off in Bremen and Hamburg has never really been dealt with. Who bought which items at these auctions? This has never been researched, even though it's all in the documents. Many people attended the auctions, not just dealers and private individuals, but also numerous Hamburg museums. Today, they are cooperating with Katrin Kleibel's research. For example, the Kunsthalle or Art Museum bought eight paintings at auction and is now looking for their rightful owners and heirs. The dream, of course, is that this room will eventually be empty that we can allocate all these items to their former owners and their rightful heirs and return them. This man's grandparents, Georg and Lotte Koch from Wiesbaden, also owned valuable paintings, which have never been returned. 
His family inquired about the missing items early on. At first they were told they had been incinerated during bombing. Later they were stumped because there were no records. But the grandson persisted and managed to find clues leading to a painting once owned by his family. Vase with Poppies by Nolder. This set everything in motion again and raised doubts that the paintings had actually disappeared or had been destroyed by fire. They must actually still exist somewhere. Johanna Ploschitzky is from Berlin. Her family estate was also plundered. Her husband Hermann, who had opened a department store in Berlin, had left his fortune to his wife. The art-loving family had bought pieces by Beckmann, Liebermann, Brack and schmidt rottluff artists who adorn museums today. Their villa in Dahlem was taken over by the National Socialists, where they trained journalists loyal to the Reich. Johanna Ploschitzky saw what was coming and fled to Los Angeles in the USA. She hoped the contents of her household would follow, except they never arrived. Her property was sold off in Hamburg in an auction that lasted three days. The hammer fell 1,500 times. Catherine Kleibel is still amazed by this case today. People came from Berlin, from Hanover, to buy at this auction. And they weren't ordinary people. They weren't people who had been bombed out. They were traders who turned a profit from buying these objects cheaply. After the war, Johanna Ploschitzky wanted her property back. She had photos to prove what belonged to her and what had been looted by the Nazis. But only a few items were ever returned. Kleibel is researching the case. She's painstakingly reconstructing the object's journeys in the hopes of finally solving this case of theft. This is not a commissioned job. It's about German guilt and justice. This set of pictures shows the furniture from Johanna Ploschitzky's house with the corresponding item number in the auction record. There are even complete shots of the living rooms, where we also find objects that correspond with the auction record. Let's take a look at this one, 109. What could it be? A Biedermeier crown was bought by Maya for 760 Reichsmark. The price was estimated at 200. That would have been this lamp here. With the help of a lawyer, Johanna Ploschitzky managed to identify 32 bargain hunters. They all denied any responsibility. My client does not recognize a duty of restitution. She acquired all items in question here in the autumn at an auction held by the Hamburg bailiff's office without having the slightest idea they might be Jewish property. Basically, every file says the same thing. We have no more records. We are not aware of the guilt. We have nothing at all to do with this. Something along those lines. The files of the restitution proceedings are stored here, in the attic of what is now the Hamburg District Court. Jürgen Lilteicher researches them. He wanted to know how the state behaved towards the injured parties and came across the Ploschitzky case. It was an especially thick file with a big strap around it. I had to open it. 
And then these photos of the estate in Berlin with these incredible artworks jumped out at me. It was an astonishing find, because it's very, very rare in restitution files that people still have photos of their property, who photographs their furniture. It was just so exceptional that I had to look into it. For victims, including Johanna Ploschitsky, there's more at stake than just their possessions. You could tell it was important to the victims that they not only got their property back, but that German courts also acknowledge that they had wronged them. And that didn't always happen because the courts were more concerned with contracts, sums of money and the like. There was close scrutiny and regulation. In 1965, after 17 years, Johanna Ploschitzky was compensated by the Federal Republic of Germany with 960,000 Deutschmarks, upon condition that she drop all further claims, a laughable sum compared to the original value of her estate. What was astonishing to me was that the state then actually stepped in, that the debt of private individuals was repaired by the state. That was a political decision in order to prevent a lengthy social discourse. We estimate that there are about 100,000 buyers in Hamburg alone. That's not just a few dozen people from some small fringe group. What would have happened if this act of discourse had actually taken place? To this day, many paintings from Johanna Ploschitzky's priceless art collection are classified as lost. Her heir continues to search for them with the help of a law firm in Munich. He's concerned with more than their value. Er hat einfach Interesse He's interested in his family history, what happened to his grandparents, especially to his grandmother. He asks himself, where have all these objects gone? Look at the photos from that time, this great villa in Dahlem, which was furnished with beautiful objects of art. And where has all this family history gone? A lifetime of pain and loss. This Chinese Buddha head was acquired in Paris and auctioned off by the National Socialists. And here we have it. One old head item, 626, acquired by the Museum of Ethnology. The bid was 500 Reichsmark, and there's also an invoice to the Museum of Ethnology. But later, in the post-war period, during the restitution negotiations, this head was apparently lost. And that was probably due to a clerical error in the restitution records, where it was listed as an old pot. So when they looked through the records, they couldn't find the head. But the head didn't actually disappear. At the end of 2020, it showed up, on display in the former Museum of Ethnology in Hamburg, now named Mark. It had been unlawfully stored in a depot for 80 years until it was brought out for an art exhibition. Kleibel is seeing it for the first time. Beautiful. To be honest, I imagined it would be much smaller. It's great to finally see it in real life and not just in pictures. Now, the long-lost Buddha head will finally be returned to Johanna Ploschitzky's heirs. The museum was already familiar with the name Ploschitzky because it had already returned six art objects to its owner after the war, but not the Buddha head. A tip from Katrin Kleibel drew the museum's attention to it. It can happen that in these large depots, objects sit for a very long time before they are brought in for a project. That's the way it works in big museums. 
We all wish we could simply process it ourselves, but that's an illusion, as it would take too much time. It's a lifelong task. You see, I don't buy that. It's an excuse. The Federal Republic of Germany committed to carrying out this research in the Washington Declaration. So it's the responsibility of the state, including the cultural senator in Hamburg, to ensure that there are adequate resources for provenance research. They committed to this and must honor this commitment. The Buddha head was tracked down thanks to the joint efforts of Katrin Kleibel and Mark. It's the first piece in Kleibel's research project to be returned. This shows that the impossible can be made possible. We can track down the looted belongings and recover them for thousands of families and people. And we are lucky here that Mark is a public institution. So it is possible to find these items, which would probably be much more difficult to do if they were in private households. This is the case of the missing Emil Nolder painting owned by the Koch family. Their grandson painstakingly searches for more clues. It passed through many hands after being bought by a cattle dealer at auction. Christie's, the auction house, also tried to sell it, in vain. It was delivered there by a gallery in Kiel. Eventually, it was sold via Austria to France. But nobody will say who has it now. There's the impression that people are stonewalling. Information is not being laid out in the table. There is no transparency. Why are they only sharing this information after four, five, six inquiries? Why not right away? The Nolder wasn't the only artwork in the Koch family's collection. It also included other valuable paintings, such as a Yavlensky, a Clay, a Rolfs. Today, they are certain that all of these artworks were looted. Beata Schreiber from the Historical Research Institute Facts and Files is trying to reconstruct the clues from numerous paintings from the Cox estate. But the Kiel Gallery claims that it no longer has any documents that could shed light on the matter. From my experience with art dealer archives, I can't imagine that they threw away all their documents in 1980 and they don't have them anymore. Every art dealer knows that documentation is the be-all and end-all of their business. So you always know what you had, who you got it from, and who you sold it to. Why aren't they telling the truth? Why are they trying to mislead us? This suggests that the people involved knew that there was something wrong with how the painting had been acquired, or that the piece had been stolen. To this day, most of the possessions belonging to the expelled Jewish community are missing. Millions of objects, everything that was dear to them, that they had hoped to take with them to begin their new lives, were sold off at auctions where anyone could get their hands on them. It's a Sisyphean task. Kleibel is working her way through mountains of files to find the names of injured parties. After a little over a year of looking on this list, I've reached the letter N. So far, that's approximately 1,700 names of victims from Hamburg. If I hold them together like this, you can see I have completed just over half of the list. So my guess would be there's about 2,700 names in total. The looted property and the names of the victims will be published in a database. Only then can the owners and their heirs assert their claims. Where has the Cox art collection gone? 
their grandson will keep searching as long as he can. Ich habe mir eben gesagt, wenn unsere Generation das nicht mehr macht, I said to myself, if our generation doesn't do this anymore, if I don't at least try to get to the bottom of this, nothing will happen. This chapter of history will be buried forever and will vanish into oblivion. A belated search for justice. Katrin Kleibel won't give up trying to right the wrongs of the Nazi art heist.